I have got the lapel mic on. That's working, is it? Lapel mic? Good. Um, this, up until this morning, I thought I was the only person who broke a limb at Eastleigh, but the Scottish Annie broke one too. So I'm in very good company, uh, but I hope I don't have to do it again at every by-election. Now, we've got a lot to get through today. Uh, this is the team who helped me with the agriculture policy. And the first message we have to get out may disappoint you a little bit, but we have to face reality. In 1991, you would have been quite correct if you said, if we leave the European Union, food prices will crash. Since 1991, things have changed. Those three great pillars of protectionism, intervention prices, high external tariffs, and export subsidies are now three heaps of rubble. That is not because the EU wanted that, it's because they were forced into it by the WTO. What we have now is food trading at around market prices, and every year, you, the taxpayers, give farmers a sum of money. Now, whilst all taxpayers are consumers, not all consumers are taxpayers. I don't want to see this statement on any leaflet. It cannot be substantiated. It is very misleading and it will make us look foolish. So what is the future for food prices? Where is it going to go? In the European Union or outside of the European Union, what is the future? Well, it's very, very volatile. Because when you're in a market price situation, you are dependent upon the weather around the world. Now, for the last three years, we have had not very favorable weather around the world. Main grains have been a bit short on yield, and prices have gone up. Well, that's very suitable for farmers. We could come into an era, and we probably will, of weather being suitable for growing crops around the world, and the price will drop, and drop, and drop. And big surpluses will overhang the market, and then farmers start to lose confidence. They won't plant, or they plant reduced acreages, then a terrorist decides to put a landmine or a water mine on a boat in Southampton Dock, and then we've got a problem. We need to keep farmers on the land. We need to have some self-sufficiency. However, we can't go back to the old system. We can't go back to the old system of deficiency payments because it's not WTO compliant. Now, farmers will say to me, oh, well, we like what UKIP says, but if we leave the European Union, we're going to lose a single farm payment and it's all going to be a disaster, so we can't vote UKIP. Well, we subsidize agriculture up until we joined, and we will continue to do so. There are three main methods that are used. In the EU, they have a single farm payment. In the USA, they have the counter-cyclical program and other various disaster reliefs. And in Canada, they have crop price insurance. Now, we could dream up something completely different, or we could borrow from one of these. And what we have decided to do is make our own version of the EU scheme, not because we have gone native, but because farmers understand it. But crucially, it has taken DEFRA eight years of blood, sweat, and tears to learn how to administer the single farm payment scheme, and it would be pointless to throw all that hard work away. So what are we going to do? We are going to have a UKIP single farm payment scheme, and we're going to get rid of a lot of jargon and a lot of the problems. It'll be a comprehensive all-in policy, no modulation, no cross-compliance, no cropping interference, no set-aside, no pillars, no axes, no co-financing, no digressivity, and no disallowance. But any farmer who wants this payment has got to farm his land to ELS standard. ELS, entry-level stewardship, that is an environmental scheme that most of us are signed up to. Any land that is farmed to that standard, the farmer cannot be accused of being an eco-disaster and clearing the whole countryside of wildlife. If you're in that scheme, you will have to look after your hedges properly, you will have to have verges beside them, you will need to sow um, bird plot cover, etc., and grass corners, various things, there's an option. That's what you will need to do to get this payment. What is it? 80 pounds an acre on the lowlands, pro rata less on the other land classifications, the other two land classifications. Now, we are going to cap this. We're going to bite the bullet and cap it. At 120,000 pounds, that means 1,500 lowland acres. Why cap it? Well, there's two reasons. The first is that once you've got to 1,500 acres, you do benefit from the economies of scale. You're on a good scale. You should be able to keep going uh, at that level of subsidy. The other reason is that the whole idea of this payment is to keep farmers on the land to produce your food 
in time of need. And we feel £120,000 is enough to keep any family going. Now, a farmer with, say, 2,000 acres will, won't like it because he's going to have 500 un under unsubsidised acres. He can do one of two things. He can either farm those extra 500 acres very intensively, he's standing on his own two feet, but of course be no ELS, or he can say, oh, I don't know, I can't possibly manage and it's all a disaster and I need public subsidy for every acre I've got. If he thinks like that, he may have a shepherd, he may have a tractor driver, he may have a foreman, he may even have a son. There's no reason why he can't let that 500 acres to that individual who can claim a single farm payment on it and the landowner can charge him a rent which reflects that. So three people are happy. The landowner gets money for doing nothing. The tenant achieves a lifetime's ambition. He's actually able to get into farming on his own account and the taxpayer feels that they are no longer giving large sums of money to a smaller and smaller number of people. We hope this will bring in some social mobility into farming in the way we like drama schools, that some people can get a start in farming, where at the moment it is a completely closed shop. We want to help the hills as much as we can. The WTO do allow us some headage payments. It's called recoupling. And so there are two reasons for doing that. One is that having a number of sheep on the hills actually helps the hills. They need the grazing. The second is that we want to stimulate some rural activity up there. It's so much better to have people working up there, albeit for fairly low incomes, and they all drift down to the towns and create social problems there. We particularly want to target this money at risk takers. Most of you who are in farming are familiar with a form that's filled in every year. Down the left-hand side is a list of all your fields, and then across from that, what is going on on them. We want to add another column at the end which says, are you, the applicant, uh, financially responsible for the, act fun for the activity on this land? In other words, do you own the livestock or have you invested in the crops? If the answer is yes, you get the payment. If the answer is no, you don't. Now, that may cause some headaches with people who let land seasonally for potatoes, etc. But the taxpayer must feel that they are giving their money to people who are taking the risk in producing their food. That is absolutely essential. And somehow we have to break the link, the mindset that's now beginning to get going, that if you own land in this country, you're automatically entitled to a pension from the public for life. We have to tr somehow try and break that. We will have a negative list, airports, golf courses, sports fields, that type of thing, which technically could be support grazing animals. We know that actually they do something quite different. They're out of it. And we're going to add a couple of ineligible features. Now, if you're farming, you will have these sophisticated maps. And on some parts of your farm, there's a red line drawn around, be it a concrete pad, a track, a pond, or whatever, which isn't eligible for subsidy. We're going to extend that to 25 yards around every single wind turbine and around every single solar array, because these things get a lot of subsidy anyway. Well, that is it in a nutshell and we hope that it manages to cut through most of the problems. On to some of the other things we've got through the, the NEC. We're going to scrap this EU obligation to re-register all pesticides. Now, it's quite possible that in Bulgaria there were pesticides for sale that never should have been. But in this country, all our pesticides had to jump through hoop after hoop, pass all sorts of safety tests. However, they've all got to submit to this re-registration at huge expense. The manufacturers have taken a pragmatic view on some of, the, some of their products and said, well, the cost of re-registering is far, far more than the sales we're going to get, the limited sales. That has meant that they can no longer control bracken on the hills because they haven't got azulam, and many horticultural pesticides are no longer available, and British farmers aren't growing those crops. We will simply scrap it. Now, these next two I want you to take together on animal welfare, etc. We support the trial culling of badgers for bovine TB control because at the moment there is no other solution. Those countries that have done it, who have got rid of the wildlife of disease, in, got rid of the reservoir of disease in wildlife, have got rid of TB in cattle. They've done it. It's not pleasant. I understand that. But we are the only party who can deliver a ban on, the, on live animal exports for slaughter. Lots of parties want to do it. We are the only one who can do it, and we will do it. it So, if you're on the doorstep and you're badgered about badgers, yes, it's emotional, I understand that.
Get the subject on to live animal exports. That is your cue. Get it onto that, because that is the more emotive of the two subjects. Now, some people say, well, why do you pick on badgers? Isn't there other wildlife that carries this disease? Why, why blame the badgers? I want to give you three personal habits of badgers, and maybe you'll, you will understand. Badgers like to have communal latrines. They enjoy that. They go out, and one area of the field, they let rip on. The grass grows really thoroughly on that area. Cow comes along, eats that nice lush grass, transmissive infection. Farmers grow something called maize for silage. It's a very, very good feed for cattle, and it's manna from heaven for badgers. They love it. That food keeps those pregnant sows and lactating sows going all the way through the winter, and that's why the population is rocketing. The problem is, an infected badger gets into a feed trough with the maize, mucus comes out of its nose, infects it, cow comes along, eats that, problem, disease transmission. A really, a badger really badly infected with this disease, it's very progressive, its lungs are all rotting, its digestive system is all going, it's in great distress, and the set mates notice. They don't comfort it, they shun it, they eject it, they evict it, they push it out. So this thing goes lumbering and blundering around the farm, eventually collapses, cow comes along, has a sniff round, infection is transmitted. This is, this is nature, I know it's rough, it's unpleasant, farming isn't all about buttercups and grinning. Please, please go back to the live animal exports. Please do that. Now the following have been well received by the NEC but not formally signed off. Other environmental schemes, um, we have decided that the ELS is enough. We have to decide what is our farmland for? Is it to produce your food or is it to create a bigger and bigger and bigger wildlife park? The RSPB at the moment have the ear of the government. They decide really what these schemes should be. They like raptors and guess what? Those raptors are going up in numbers and our songbirds are coming down in numbers. If the RSPB want particular areas of the country farmed in a certain way, they're very wealthy, and they can approach a farmer and say, do this, do that, we will pay you, and he will do it. The same applies to county councils. For example, Norfolk, my county, the Brecklands. If Norfolk County Council wants certain measures taken in the Brecks, they're an elected institution. They can give the farmers some money to do it. On labelling, method of production, everyone has a right to know what they're eating. Everybody does. The EU govern the whole thing. We want to see method of production, method of slaughter, GM declaration, hormone declaration. You might say, well, why is country of origin missing? The problem is, with some of these processed foods, some can come from that country and some can come from that. It is actually quite difficult to do that. Bush meat, etc. You may come back from Argentina and the Falkland Islands with a ham sandwich. You will not understand the damage that that thing can do. At an airport, you're asked if you've got anything to, de to declare, and you should declare if you've got any food. Likewise, if you happen to go to Gatwick or Heathrow Airport at about 6 or 7 in the morning, and you'll see people staggering off the plane, carrying a bulging suitcase, dripping fluids, packed full of monkeys and dead snakes and God knows what, we don't want it. We don't want it. We want some sniffer dogs to, to stop that trade. Finally, on, on this thing, we want to scrap this EU fish bait nonsense. We have little cottage industries that produce fish bait for anglers. The EU have come blundering in and said, oh, that recipe of yours has got to come under a tome of regulation that thick about animal feedstuffs. That regulation is killing that little cottage industry. Just get rid of it. We can do it. This is an interesting one, nitrates in water. Now, we used to have competence in this until the EU took over. And we had a limit, and our limit was a maximum of 100 milligrams of nitrate per litre of water. And we were safe within that limit. You know you're not if women start bearing blue-coloured babies. That's the problem with too much nitrate in the water. We didn't get it at our old British limit. The EU come along and say, you've got to halve it. You've got to halve it to 50. It's a huge problem for us, because in the eastern side of the country, quite naturally, the water is somewhere between 50 and 100. So the NFU commissioned a study, what are we going to do to get this down to 50? And the answer came back from an official study, you will have to set aside half of the arable land in East Anglia as ungrazed set aside, quite untenable, quite unnecessary. We need to get science to bear on this to get that level of 50 up, maybe to 100, but interestingly and fittingly, if you were to change that word litre, cross that out and put pint, the problem would be solved. On, on rural crime, we want 
We want police commissioners to cooperate with local farm watch. Farm watch given a lot of intelligence and information, a lot of problems now with cameras in the cities, the criminals are coming out into our areas. Ragwort, uh, it's, it is against the law to have it. We want the you know, local councils to uphold it. Something for prisons and community service to people to do to pull this weed out of the ground and put it in a bag. Now the following, the following are agreed. Are we there? I'm there, right. Well, I'm sorry. Well, you, what about the last chap? You gave him nearly 10 minutes extra. <laughs> All right, okay, Chairman, you're in charge. I'll have to pack it up. I will go to any branch, anywhere, and talk about this. I don't care how hostile the audience is, some things need saying. Thank you very much.